Hello again and welcome to Plug Life Television and to another episode of What Barriers Balancing the Rapid Charge to Electric Vehicles. We've already balanced the grid, we've balanced raw materials and we've balanced social mobility, but how is the government going to balance the books once petrol and diesel cars have been replaced with electric vehicles? Given that of course there's a fuel duty applied to petrol and diesel and there's not currently to electric vehicles, how is that revenue going to be recouped? Today the government generates revenue from petrol and diesel cars through a tax on the vehicle itself and the fuel that that vehicle uses. EVs and fuel cell vehicles don't have vehicle excise duty or car tax applied to them and the only tax on fuel at present is any tax associated with electricity tariffs. So what will happen when petrol and diesel cars are no longer on Britain's roads? It would be easy enough to add car tax to EVs and fuel cell vehicles and to tax hydrogen like petrol or diesel but it would be difficult to impose a tax on electricity used in EVs, especially for people who charge at home. In theory, a fuel tax on electricity could be imposed by using smart home chargers connected to smart meters, which would measure the electricity consumed by the smart charger and apply an EV fuel tax to it accordingly. However, since EVs can be charged off of a 3-pin domestic socket, all the owner would need to do is open the window and run their 3-pin so-called granny cable out to the car bypassing the smart charger. If the taxman came knocking, the owner could claim that the electricity was used to power any number of household appliances, such as an electric heater. This means that EVs could lead to a shortfall in revenue from fuel tax. There are three main solutions to this. The first is a higher car tax on EVs, which fits into the existing system, but penalises low mileage motorists. Fuel tax on electricity is similar to the existing system, but could only realistically be implemented at public charge points for the reasons described previously. The third option is pay per mile. This has numerous advantages. It can be easily implemented since the mileage could be checked each year during the car's MOT or prior to the sale of the vehicle, and the details sent off to the DVLA or Inland Revenue to apply tax accordingly. It also encourages active travel or use of public transport rather than over-reliance on cars for short journeys since it reflects the true cost of motoring. Some high mileage motorists may feel hard done by, especially if they need to drive for their job, but their employer should reimburse their motoring costs as is done today. But how much would pay per mile add to the running cost of an EV? For this, let's assume a scenario where the UK government would look to recoup all lost fuel duty based on the average fuel economy of a new petrol car. According to the RAC, in 2018, the average fuel consumption of a new petrol car was 50.5 miles per gallon, or 11.1 miles per litre. The UK government currently applies a fuel duty of 57.95 pence per litre to petrol and diesel. This works out at a fuel duty of 5.2 pence per mile. Therefore, pay per mile for EVs would be around 5.2 pence per mile. However, bear in mind that this is the equivalent of what drivers have been paying through petrol and diesel anyway. Plus, fuel duty is only about half the cost of petrol at the moment. Taking an average of around £1.20 per litre, then the total cost of petrol is, on average, roughly 10.8 pence per mile including fuel duty and 5.6 pence per mile without it. A standard domestic electricity tariff in the UK is about 15 pence per kilowatt hour and the average electric car does 4 miles per kilowatt hour. So the cost of electric motoring per mile is currently about 3.75 pence per mile, and would be 8.95 pence per mile with pay per mile fuel duty added. This still works out cheaper than running a petrol car, and that's without factoring in the significant savings in maintenance costs and low emission zone charges, plus the progress in battery tech that will make EVs cheaper to buy than petrol cars in the near future. Plus, as we've discussed before, EVs are even cheaper to run if they're charged using off-peak tariffs, home renewables, free workplace or public charge points, or dynamic tariffs that pay people to use electricity when there are excess renewables on the grid. Octopus Go gives EV drivers 4 hours of electricity at 5 pence per kilowatt hour overnight, which is a 66% saving compared to an average tariff of around 15 pence per kilowatt hour. EVs charged overnight on Octopus Go would cost 6.45 pence per mile to run including fuel duty, but currently cost 1.25 pence per mile without it. Free charge points, or charging using home renewables, is currently 0 pence per mile and would only be 5.2 pence per mile with fuel duty added, 
In other words, the total fuel cost would be the cost of the fuel duty itself. Dynamic electricity tariffs like Agile Octopus continuously fluctuate based on electricity demand and supply, and pay users to charge their car when there's excess renewable electricity on the grid. I've taken a payment of 1 pence per kilowatt hour as a conservative example, but recently customers have been paid as much as 11 pence per kilowatt hour in these circumstances. At present, customers who charge their car when the tariff was minus 1 pence per kilowatt hour would be paid a quarter of a penny per mile to run their EV. And this effectively cancels out part of the cost of the fuel duty if or when this is eventually applied. The elephant in the room is public rapid chargers, which are always going to be more expensive in destination charging because of the higher cost of both the charger itself and the grid connection required to power it. Using Instavolt's 35 pence per kilowatt hour as a representative example, EVs currently cost about 8.75 pence per mile to run when publicly rapid charged but they would cost 13.95 pence per mile with fuel duty added, making them more expensive than a new petrol car filled at a supermarket petrol station. However, unlike a petrol car filled at a supermarket petrol station, most EVs have access to much cheaper forms of charging elsewhere, and use these most of the time. A typical EV driver does 90% of their charging at home, work, or on another form of destination charge point, and just 10% of charging on a public rapid charger, usually when driving longer journeys. If we assume a home electricity tariff of 15 pence per kilowatt hour, in other words, no home renewables or smarter, cheaper tariffs, then the average cost of electric motoring, based on the 9 to 1 ratio of destination to rapid charging, is just 4.25 pence per mile today, way less than a petrol car, and 9.45 pence per mile including fuel duty, which still works out cheaper than petrol or diesel. Once again, this figure doesn't factor in vastly reduced maintenance bills, exemption from low emission zone charges, or advances in battery tech that will make EVs cheaper to buy than petrol or diesel cars in the first place. With the widespread installation of home and on-street charge points, and the construction of urban charging hubs, rapid chargers will only be an occasional use for the vast majority of EV drivers. This means that any additional expense incurred in using rapid chargers is a drop in the ocean versus the financial savings of running an electric vehicle even with pay-per-mile fuel duty applied. So there we have it. I reckon pay-per-mile is going to be the most realistic way that governments are going to recoup that petrol and diesel duty that has been lost because everyone has switched to electric vehicles. It's too easy to circumnavigate the whole idea of a smart charger billing someone fuel duty on top of their electricity because you could just unplug from the smart charger and plug into any dumb socket that you have in your house that you would otherwise plug in a toaster or a heater. And indeed, you could argue that's what you were doing instead of charging your car. So yeah, to save any faff about it in that sense, pay per mile seems to be the easiest system to implement. And as we've already seen from the figures, it's already cheaper, even with fuel duty added, or you know, hypothetically added, to run an electric car in terms of its fuel costs than it is a petrol or diesel car. And that's without taking into account further savings in maintenance, because you've only got a handful of moving components in an EV versus hundreds in a petrol or a diesel car. Savings on congestion zone and low emission zone charges, you can sail straight through there in an EV. You cannot in a petrol or a diesel car. And of course, advancements in battery tech, which are gradually bringing costs down to the point that the EV will cost less to buy in the first place than petrol or diesel cars of an equivalent spec. And in fact, we've already reached that because the, the magical figure for that crossover point or that cost parity point is allegedly $100 per kilowatt hour of battery capacity. Now, interestingly, CATL, the big Chinese company that's built the cell to pack lithium iron phosphate battery that Tesla is allegedly going to use in its standard range Chinese built Tesla Model 3, that battery pack apparently costs about $80 per kilowatt hour. So in some circumstances, we've already passed that point, And it's not going to be too long before other chemistries and other manufacturers follow suit and manage to get that price down below that crossover point. So that argument of, oh, EVs are still more expensive to buy through, it, it, it won't exist. That will be gone. And we will have balanced just about everything. Take care. See you again soon for another episode of Plug Life Television.